Good evening, everyone. My name is Adam, and I want to thank you all very much for joining me this evening to learn a little bit more about the reptiles and amphibians that we have in our province. My name, uh, like again, I said, is Adam, and I'm the park interpreter in Whiteshell Provincial Park. Now, the White Shell is located on Treaty Third Territory 3, which is the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Métis Nation. Indigenous peoples have a deep respect for really all forms of wildlife, and this does not, of course, exclude reptiles and amphibians. For example, a number of amphibians or reptiles appear in a number of Anishinaabe stories, as well as turtles and snakes are very common forms of petroforms, a type of indigenous rock art that are found in Bannock Point in the white shell. Uh, and another cool thing is that the logo, the identifier for the white shell is actually a turtle petroform. Now indigenous peoples have deep respect for the wildlife, like I said, and so too should we. Lots of these critters that I'm gonna show you today, we connect with without even realizing it. And the first thing I'm going to get everybody to do is actually stop staring at your screen for a second, close your eyes, and just listen to this sound that we're going to play for you. Much as I hate to turn that off, <laughs> still to this day, that is one of my favorite noises. It's a wonderful omen that spring and summer are indeed on the way. Take our poll really quick here to see if you can figure out what type of animal that was. Now, when you see the options, if you're maybe a little confused about it, uh, best thing to do is remember that scientists are very smart, but they're very unimaginative when naming animals. A lot of times, if you don't know the name of an animal, you can usually just look at it or listen to it, and you can probably figure out what it is. So let's see if we can figure out what critter made that noise. And once our survey come to, perfect. So the overwhelming majority of you, 83%, Guessed correctly, that is the Northern Spring Peeper. Uh, now that is, as I said, one of my favorite noises to hear. Great omen that summer is coming. And it's amazing how often different noises can actually connect us with something uh, either to the present or the past. Take a moment in the chat box and just really quickly enter any quick thoughts or emotions that just immediately popped into your head once you heard that noise. Take a second to do that now. For myself, when I hear the spring peeper, I honestly, yes, think of spring for sure, and winter is finally almost over, but I also think back to being a kid and growing up, and when I started hearing that sound, I knew one very important thing. There was only about two months of school left. The important part of that is at the end of that, we could then go to our cottage, our family cottage, for the entire summer and uh, be on the beach, playing, swimming in the lake, and all of that was a great reminder from the spring peeper that that's coming. So let's see what some of you guys have thought of in our chat here. It's always interesting to see what different kinds of noises uh, mean different things to different people. So we had one question in there, and uh, we'll actually get to that in a second. What is a peeper? I'm going to show you in just a moment when we go through all the different reptiles and amphibians that we have in our province. Now, the truth is that all the different animals that we have, uh, the reptiles and amphibians, collectively known as herps, we should definitely be showing these animals respect for a variety of reasons. They are wonderful symbols in Indigenous culture. They serve as wonderful reminders to us that spring and summer are on the way. And believe it or not, they are also good indicator species for particular habitats that help us with our drinking water. More on that later. But for starters, let's just figure out what a herp is. So 
for whatever reason, reptiles and amphibians are grouped kind of into the same group as herps, and the study of which is called herpetology. Now, why these two groups of animals are so often joined together is really anybody's guess. Truthfully, I guess they do have a number of key similarities. Um, for starters, about a month ago, they were all doing the exact same thing, waking up. All reptiles and amphibians in Manitoba hibernate. Now, even with that, they all hibernate in different places. For example, things like wood frogs and tree frogs, they can actually produce their own antifreeze, so they can hibernate above the frost line and basically just go under some leaves or go under a lock or a rock and just kind of sit there all winter and hibernate. Not so with things like toads or leopard frogs. They actually have to dig in the mud under the water at the bottom of a lake or a pond where they're below the frost line. So it's very cold, but it's not below freezing. Even reptiles don't really hibernate in a consistent way. Animals like snakes will hibernate in large groups of sometimes tens of thousands of snakes in these big underground areas known as hibernaculas, where turtles, on the other hand, uh, very similar to our toads that we just talked about. They just kind of dig a little bit under the mud at the bottom of a pond or a lake and just kind of sit there and hibernate all through the winter. Now, that's one key thing they have in common. Another one, I guess, would be that they all share a lot of the same habitat, that being wetlands. Truth be told, wetlands are wonderful habitats for literally pretty much every kind of animal. <laughs> when we look at what an animal needs to survive, being food, water, shelter, space, and oxygen, wetlands are great suppliers of all of those things, particularly for things like amphibians. Frogs, toads, salamanders, they all need a wet or moist type of environment to live in. So too then do their predators. So things like snakes, they love to eat frogs and toads, they'll hang out in those areas as well. Now, as far as the similarities go, that's about all the big ones. There are a few more, but what makes these animals different is really key here. And the variety of herps that we have in Manitoba is vast. When you take into account all the frogs, toads, salamanders, snakes, turtles, even lizards, there are 24 different species of animals. And we're gonna take a look at all of those right now. And just as a precursor, we are gonna be looking at the snakes first. So like I said, we'll be taking a look at our snakes first, just in case there are any people who are scared of them and don't want them to pop up out of nowhere. Now, the first one that we're gonna take a look at is actually the largest in Manitoba, our garter snake. Now we'll take a look at these first because these ones can actually be a little tricky to identify. For example, we don't actually have just one garter snake. We have two species of garter snakes, the common garter snake that's up top and the plains garter snake down on the bottom. And to make things even more confusing, there are two distinct subspecies of the common garter snake in Manitoba the red-sided, which is still up top, and the eastern garter snake, which is now down on the bottom. And yes, if you remember from the previous slide, the eastern garter snake looks very similar to the plains garter snake. Furthermore, the red-sided garter snake, the red sides on them are not always as prominent as they are in this picture here. So how do we tell the difference between all these critters? Well, let's start with the eastern garter snake first. So first thing we can do is actually look at their head. They have a lighter colored head. It's almost more of a brown as opposed to a black like the others. The yellow strip is another giveaway. Uh, this stripe on the Eastern garter snake goes all the way down the side as opposed to the Plains garter snake, which is just one row of scales that make up the yellow stripe. Now for our red sided garter snakes, if they don't have the red sides as prominent as this, if you look at their yellow stripe, it actually takes up the second and third row of scales moving up from the belly, as opposed to the plains garter snake, which just has the one row of scales. Now, most of these snakes get to a pretty hefty size. Uh, one meter or a little over three feet in length is fairly common. However, some of the larger females 
have been recorded at being about four and a half feet long. And that's a pretty big snake. Garter snakes are actually about to be very active as it will soon be their mating season. Snakes emerge from their hibernaculas in early April, depending on what the weather is doing. Mating season begins shortly after that, which is what we're looking at right now. Numerous males are pursuing one female to mate with. And as we can see here in the reptile world, females are the larger. And I can speak from personal experience, uh, can be kind of the nastier ones too. Now if we take a look, we can see one very large female in there buried amongst all the males that are trying to mate with her. One of them might eventually be successful. These mating balls can actually become so large at some point that they actually can completely carpet uh, the entire area that the snakes are on. And that's what we're seeing here. So there's a few female snakes in there somewhere. To a degree, we can also tell what kind of snake we have uh, based on where we are. Now, these are approximate range maps for our herps. Plains garter snakes are typically found in the southern portion of central and western Manitoba, whereas the red-sided garter snake is found pretty much everywhere in the southern half of the province and is definitely the most common snake in Manitoba. Chances are, if you've seen a snake in our province, it was the red-sided garter snake. And the eastern garter snake just makes it into the southeast corner of our province. Now, I promise you that is the most confusing part of our snakes. For example, this next snake here is green and it looks smooth. It is called the smooth green snake. Found throughout central and western Manitoba, uh, this is more of a medium sized snake in our province. Gets to be about 20, 24 inches in length, uh, but doesn't quite get the girth of our garter snakes that we see here. Or this snake here for that matter. This is the Western hognose snake. And as its name implies, it's found in Western Manitoba, kind of around the Carberry Spruce Woods area. And this snake gets its name from its upturned snout that kind of helps it look like a bit of a pig or a hog. The snake also has the most unique way of defending itself among reptiles. So don't be grossed out. This is not a dead snake. Hognose snakes will, when threatened, roll onto their back, hang their mouth open, and make a really bad smell. The idea is there aren't a whole lot of animals out there that will eat a dead snake, and they're right. Now, lastly, we have Manitoba's smallest snake, the northern red belly snake. Now, here we can clearly see where they get their name from. Oddly enough, this snake is very common uh, throughout of most of southern Manitoba, but it's rarely seen. Now this isn't too surprising as it only grows about maybe 10 or 12 inches at most. most. Most pretty much just reach the size of a pencil. Now that coupled with its brown back camouflages them into the ground very well, making this snake very elusive. In keeping with our reptiles, we'll take a look at our turtles next. So Manitoba has two species of turtles. Both of them are very common and found pretty much everywhere in southern Manitoba. First up is the western painted turtle. Being the smaller of the two, these are often seen in summer, sunning themselves on logs or rocks. And from the range map we can see here, it's not surprising that almost everyone has seen one of these probably at some point. And as we look underneath, we can see where the painted portion of their name comes from. Now this unique coloration, begs the question, how does this help the turtle blend in? Truthfully, it doesn't. Sure, the camouflage uh, on their dark shells uh, helps blend them into the dark bottom of the water below, so if something's above them, they're not going to see it, but that belly sticks out like a sore thumb. There's a reason for this. Typically in nature, when an animal is brightly colored and stands out in its environment, those are warning signs. Skunks are great examples of this. Uh, certainly, there's also bright colored butterflies that are poisonous or toxic as well. But painted turtles aren't poisonous, they're not toxic. So why are they brightly colored? Well, years ago, scientists did an experiment with some young uh, painted turtles. They put some in an aquarium 
with a large northern pike. It's a big fish we have in Manitoba. Now the pike would try to eat them as was expected, but shortly after gulping the turtles in their mouth, they spat them out and left them alone. So what happened? Once the turtle was in the fish's mouth, they began scraping and clawing and scratching the inside of the fish's mouth. And the pike spat them out and remembered that those bright colors mean trouble. This critter, on the other hand, doesn't need to worry about predators once it gets to full size. This is the common snapping turtle. This is the largest reptile in Canada. For them to weigh between 25 and 30 pounds in the wild is totally normal. In fact, the largest one on record was 75 pounds. It's found all over southern Manitoba and is probably in every lake, river, pond, or wetland to be found. Now that being said, do not be scared. There is no record of a snapping turtle biting anyone while under the water. Underwater, they're big babies. They just want to get away from anything bigger than them, namely us. Outside the water is a little different. Over three quarters of their time is spent in the water, really only coming out in June to lay their eggs. This is sometimes when we see them crossing highways. When they're out of water, they're also on edge and much more likely to show you why they're called snapping turtles. And last up for our reptiles is our lizard. Yes, singular. Manitoba only has one species of lizard, the Northern Prairie Skink. While we only have one lizard, this is definitely one of the most unique herps in our province. This little guy's range is very small, just a few small pockets around the Brandon and Spruce Woods area. One of the things that makes this thing unique is its tail. This is a juvenile we're looking at right here. We can tell that because it's a nice bright blue on the tail. However, that isn't the coolest thing. The coolest thing is that they can actually lose their tail as a form of defense. Their tails can actually detach and be left behind to distract the predator while the skink retreats to safety. This skink here is now regrowing its tail after it's lost it, which usually takes about a year to do. Now that's it for our reptiles. So we're gonna switch over to our amphibians and we'll kick it off with our salamanders. So Manitoba has four species of salamander, the smallest being this one right here, the blue spotted salamander. So this little critter is found mainly in eastern Manitoba as they tend to prefer wetlands within the boreal forest. This little guy is very often overseen despite his bright blue spots. This is actually a larger one here <laughs> you can see, which still is not very big. They're fairly small and very nocturnal. In fact, the only time I've ever seen these ones in the wild is when I was intentionally looking for them at night in spring when they're in mating season. And for those of us that remember how big pennies are, this is a good example of how small the young ones can be right here. On the larger side, however, is our tiger salamanders. Manitoba has two types of tiger salamanders, the barred and eastern tiger salamanders. Like I said, these are on the larger, larger side. This is actually a picture of me holding them so you can see roughly how big these ones get. That's the barred tiger salamander we see here. Mostly they're found in central and western Manitoba. Uh, they're fairly common, but like the blue spotted salamander, very elusive. Now, personally, my favorite colored herp in Manitoba is this one, the eastern tiger salamander. I didn't even know we had these in our province until I was either 16 or 17 years old. Uh, from what we know, this salamander is in this small little range down in southeastern Manitoba that we see here. Our last salamander is not only the largest, but the only completely aquatic salamander. All the other ones that we just saw, they can breathe on land. This one can't. The mud puppy goes through a transformation cycle like other salamanders, except they never lose their gills. That's those red frill things by their head. Now, some have been reported to be a little under two feet long, but much more common is about one foot. They have been found in southeastern Manitoba, 
but it's likely that they really could be all over the place, just no one's found them yet. As they're completely aquatic, they're very rarely documented. And just actually speaking of their life cycle for a second, interesting note, for whatever reason, salamanders, much like frogs, go through a transformation cycle where they are uh, laid as eggs, they hatch as tadpole or larvae, slowly grow their legs, and lose their tail. Uh, for whatever reason, with salamanders, the front legs come in first, and then the back legs. This is opposite to the frogs. And of course, they never lose their tail. And speaking of frogs, we'll get on to our vocal amphibians now, starting with the frogs. So Manitoba has eight species of frogs. And the first one we look at here is a little on the rarer side, as well as having the most unimaginative name in the animal kingdom. What we are looking at is called the green frog. Now, of course, not all green frogs are green. Some are brown, like this sample here. The male green frogs begin calling in late June and continue throughout August. So let's have a listen to what this frog sounds like. So as far as we can tell, the green frog is a little on the, again, on the rarer side, and pretty much just in this little spot out in Nopaming Provincial Park in eastern Manitoba here. This frog is a little bit different. This is very, very common. This is actually the largest frog in Manitoba, the northern leopard frog. So like with other frogs, their color can vary a little bit from a bright green to, in some cases, a darker, almost brown color. But they all have the trademark leopard spots that help camouflage this frog into its environment very well. Late April to mid-May is when the males begin calling for their mate, and this is what they sound like. The northern leopard frog is a curious example. If you look at the National Endangered Species list, the leopard frog is on it. Not in Manitoba, however. They are very abundant. So abundant that up until the 1970s, Manitoba actually exported roughly 50,000 kilograms, or roughly 1 million leopard frogs, into the scientific dissection trade. If you were dissecting frogs in our province in school at that point, was with a frog that came from here. Now, a disease ran through Manitoba in the 1970s, which nearly wiped out all the leopard frogs, which assisted with ending that commercial trade. Numbers have recovered since then, but it is still illegal to possess leopard frogs, along with any native Manitoba wildlife. Now, this medium-sized frog is probably the most common and widely distributed frog in Manitoba, the wood frog. Now, an easy way to identify this frog is the black bands behind their eyes. This frog has already been calling for a few weeks and will probably continue until mid-May. Chances are you've heard this one before. I wasn't kidding. This is the most widely distributed frog in our province, even extending uh, past our northern border up into Nunavut there. Now, this is because what makes this medium frog uh, sized frog so special is in its blood, like I mentioned earlier. Wood frogs produce their own antifreeze, so they can hibernate where the temperatures go below freezing. If you're out hiking this winter near a water body, you very well could have been stepping over these little frogsicles and not even realize it. Scientists are actually experimenting with wood frogs to see if they can apply the wood frog's antifreeze to organ donation, being able to uh, more effectively freeze organs for longer safe transportation. After mid-May, when mating season is done, large clumps of eggs can be seen in water bodies, uh, including ditches, looking like this. 
This little frog here is the one that we heard at the beginning, the Northern Spring Peeper. Now, one of the identifying marks on this frog is actually the X on its back, if you can see that there. Males will start calling in early May until June. And just because I like it so much, we'll listen to it one more time. Spring peepers are pretty much found only in eastern Manitoba and are one of the smallest frogs in our province, but not the smallest. That title is held by this frog that also begins calling the earliest. Beginning in mid-April, the boreal chorus frog is the first reminder that winter is gone and spring is right around the corner. I've been hearing these little guys around my house uh, for a few weeks already, and this is what they sound like. Very widespread again, similar to the wood frog, um, but as we can see here, way tinier. That's full grown right there. Next up is the mink frog. This frog actually has uh, more of a creative name in that while they don't look like a mink, which is a small weasel that hangs out by the water, they do smell like mink. Now, if you haven't had the pleasure, just imagine what rotting onions smell like. This frog starts calling considerably later than our previous examples. Mid-June is when you'd start hearing this one. So similar to the green frog, the mink frog is fairly uncommon in Manitoba. It is quite common, however, in Whiteshell and Nopaming Provincial Parks. Now, mink frogs are about medium to large frogs that do eventually lose their tails. And this is actually one of the few frogs that will sit on lily pads. These next guys are really, really cool. Manitoba actually has frogs that completely change color. Truthfully, a lot of our frogs can change color to a minor degree, but not to the extreme as these ones here. The gray tree frog and the copse gray tree frog can actually change from a bright green like this to a dark gray or brown in the span of about one hour. Can you see it? How about now? The other unique thing is that while we have two types of gray tree frog, they look exactly the same. The only way for us to tell the difference is by listening to their calls, which are very different. Um, both males will begin calling around mid-May to May-June. Now this is what the Copes gray tree frog sounds like. And this is what the just gray tree frog sounds like. Oh, try this again. The fact that these two look exactly the same is also why their range map kind of overlaps here, because if you just see one in spring, summer, or fall, uh, just by looking at it, it is impossible to tell the difference. Now, last up, we will take a look at our toads. So Manitoba has four toad species. The most common in the white shell where I'm standing is the American toad. Late May is when the males start calling for a mate, and this is what these ones sound like. So not only common in the white shell, but pretty much uh, anywhere in southeastern Manitoba, these are also some of the larger ones. Get a nice handful of toad there. One of the key things, among others, that actually separates toads from frogs is how the females will lay the eggs. As opposed to frogs that lay their eggs in big clumps like we saw earlier, toads will lay their eggs in these long strands like we see here. Now, just as we have the American toad, we also have the Canadian toad. The time that they start calling is about the same as the American toad, late May, and this is what the Canadian toad sounds like. Now, 
The Canadian toad is pretty widespread and common throughout uh, central and even western Manitoba. Now, obviously, these two toads uh, do look very similar. There's one key difference uh, to tell just from looking at them, the Canadian versus the American, and it's all on their head. If you look at the American toad, it's got two individual crests between their eyes versus the Canadian toad, those two crests merge at the back. The smallest toad in Manitoba is the Plains Spadefoot. So this little guy has his name because of his back feet. His back feet kind of look like spades or shovels, and they will actually dig themselves underground backwards when they feel threatened. It's just like they kind of disappear into the dirt. Now, because there aren't many of them in our province, no one's really sure about the month that they start calling, but it's usually late spring. So let's see if you've heard this one before. Spadefoot just makes it into the southwestern corner of the province. And lastly, we have the Great Plains Toad. So similar to the Spadefoot, they're not very common in Manitoba. So again, the precise month they begin calling isn't 100%, but it's usually late spring. So let's have a listen. As we can see here, this toad has an even smaller range than the plain spadefoot. These ones are very rare in our province. Would like to give a quick thank you to naturenorth.com for all of the pictures, sounds, and videos we just saw and listened to. reason that I ended on the plain spadefoot, not just because somebody's got to be last, but the plain spadefoot, or the plain, or the great plains toad, sorry, is a wonderful example of truthfully how little we know about some of our Manitoba herps. If anyone's looking to get into uh, learning more about reptiles and amphibians in our province, a great place to start would be a book called The Reptiles and Amphibians of Manitoba. It's an older book, it is still available online. It was first published in 1982. It's a great book, still holds up, except there is one glaring omission. That book doesn't have the Great Plains Toad in it. Now, why would that be? It's not because the author didn't like the toad. It's because the Great Plains Toad wasn't discovered in Manitoba until the late 1980s or early 1990s. So basically the Great Plains Toad is not in the Manitoba Reptiles and Amphibians book because when it was published in 1982, we didn't know we had it. This by the way is not unique to just the Great Plains Toad. There's a bunch of species that really we're not totally sure exactly where they are. Salamanders are a great example of this. I mentioned a little bit of this in the slideshow a moment ago, but things like mud puppies, the range map just showed a little section of uh, southeastern Manitoba. But like I said, truthfully, they could be all over the place. That area in the range map is just where we happen to have stumbled across them. Because they're completely aquatic, again, they're very hard to monitor. The eastern tiger salamander is another wonderful example of this as well. Uh, yes, their range map is very, very small in southeastern Manitoba. But again, that's just because that's all that we've found them. That's the only place where we found them. the range could be quite a bit larger. It's just that nobody's been looking for them. But the truth is, we really should be looking for all these animals and knowing where they are. Because not only are the reptiles and amphibians of Manitoba uh, important symbols in indigenous culture, great reminders that spring and summer are on the way. But like I said at the beginning, they're good indicator species for indicating whether our drinking water is going to be healthy or not. Now, how the heck does that happen? Amphibians in particular are really good, what are called indicator species. Now an indicator species is a fancy term for the species that indicates something. Who'd have thunk, right? Amphibians are wonderful indicator species for water quality. Uh, if there's any pollution or chemicals in a water body, the amphibians are gonna be the first to go. 
And this is because amphibian skin is absorbent, just like a sponge. So anything that's around it is going to absorb into its body, including pollution or runoff or added chemicals. So if you go by a water body when the frogs are calling uh, around that time and you actually hear them doing that, that's a good indicator that that water body is healthy. And this is important for wetlands particularly, because just like amphibians, wetlands are basically giant sponges on the landscape that soak up all the water in the surrounding areas, filter it, and then when that water leaves the wetland, it's actually cleaner than when it went in. So it's very important to monitor habitats like these and having indicator species like amphibians, as well as reptiles like snakes that like to eat the frogs and toads, having those critters around is a really, really good way to start. The key thing is making sure we know where these critters are. You at home can help us and scientists learn more about these little things by participating in a number of what are called citizen science programs. So you could participate in programs such as Frog Watch, the Manitoba Herps Atlas, or the Salamander Cooperative. So all these, like I said, are citizen science-based programs where we rely on you, people out on the landscape, to record and report what you're seeing. It's a lot more efficient with how vast Manitoba is to have all these people that live all over the province reporting into one area what they found rather than having somebody or scientists drive all over kingdom come to get really minimal results. Now, not only are we gonna be helping scientists by doing this, but we're also gonna be doing a good service for ourselves. In these very challenging times, one of the things that lots of people are doing is really trying to reconnect with nature. Well, I can't think of an easier way to reconnect with nature than by going out for an evening hike near a wetland or another type of water body and listening for frogs. Granted, that's what I did most of the time as I was a kid, but it's something we can all do now. And while it's a great thing to do in provincial parks, you don't necessarily need to make it to a provincial park. There is lots of wildlife people don't even realize living in big urban centers or cities. Just go out for a walk in the evening in a park or anywhere where there's still sitting water around this time of year and for the next couple of weeks. Guarantee it, you're gonna hear some of the things that I just played for you right now. And that's one of the things that's important. Make sure we know how to identify these things and how we can help scientists figure out where they are. Because once again, our herps in Manitoba are wonderful symbols in indigenous culture, great memories and great indicators that spring and summer are on the way, and they help us in preserving our drinking water. Now those citizen science programs I talked about uh, Frog Watch, if more information is available at naturewatch.ca. The Manitoba Herps Atlas is available through the iNaturalist app. And more information on the Salamander Cooperative is available at naturenorth.com. But even just listening to me tonight is a great first step towards helping our Manitoba Herps. And as we've seen from that slideshow there, we got a lot of cool critters in our province. It's time we start learning more about them and showing them the respect they deserve. So with that, I wanna thank all of you very much for listening to me tonight. And now, if anybody does have any questions about the reptiles and amphibians of Manitoba, you can enter them into the chat box and we will do our best to answer as many as we can. Uh, thanks, Adam. Our first question here is, uh, what, uh, sorry, where, where does the name herp actually come from? We know it's reptile and amphibian, but why, why that name herps? You know what, off the top of my head, I don't know where the term herp actually comes from. I could assume it's from another old word from uh, society long ago, but I'm not 100% sure where that term comes from. It is one of my favorite terms for describing animals though. Very unique. Uh, some of the uh, frog calls didn't play too well coming through. Are the, can they be heard on Nature North? Yes, so if any of you did have trouble hearing any of the frog or toad calls, uh, log on to naturenorth.com and go to the Herps Atlas section. There's a link to it there as well. And there they have all the information about all the animals I showed you and all of the calls are on there as well. 
Are any of the species here in Manitoba poisonous for humans? So are any of the animals that I showed you poisonous to humans? For the most part, no. So things like uh, the snakes that we have, none of them are venomous to humans. And even that, none of them have the big viper-like fangs we think of when we think of snake teeth. Uh, some of the garter snakes do have a small row of teeth towards the back of their mouth, but that's more for just grabbing onto something and holding on to it. Those snakes actually do have a small neurotoxin that helps paralyze their prey, but it's absolutely uh, not venomous to humans whatsoever. Uh, do you have an approximate census of how many hognose snakes there are in Manitoba? Uh, I ask because I've been to Spruce Woods for the last 30 years and I've yet to see one. <laughs> for sure. Um, so this is one of the things that's really tricky with a lot of herps. Uh, I talked a little bit about this with mud puppies and salamanders, but uh, truthfully, it's very common for all the different herps that don't make any noise. Snakes in particular are really hard to monitor because they're solitary and they're very well camouflaged. So chances are you may have, uh, you, I know you do go to spruce woods quite a bit. You may have actually been near one, but didn't actually realize it when you were there. I don't know exactly how many are in the province because again, snakes are a very, very difficult species uh, to monitor. That's why we really rely on people contributing to some of these citizen science programs like the Herps Atlas to figure out where these critters are. Does handling frogs or toads harm them at all? It can. So like I said, the amphibians have absorbent skin. So anything that is uh, particularly in the water will absorb into them. But anything we have on our hands, whether it's sunscreen, bug spray, or 12th layer of hand sanitizer for the day, you know, can keep us safe, but it can make those frogs very sick. This is why, as remember, frogs and toads and amphibians, they are all wildlife. We do not want to pick them up. Specifically for that reason, we could make them sick uh, without trying to. Uh, I saw a turtle with a cracked shell on the side of a highway once. Hmm. What could have happened to it and what could I have done to help? So in all likelihood, what probably happened was it was unfortunately uh, hit by a car or some type of motor vehicle. Uh, in terms of what you could have done for it, uh, if you were able to do so safely, you could have tried to take it to a, a wildlife rehab center, like the Wildlife Haven Rehabilitation Center. Um, but chances are, after an animal like that gets hit by a car, the survival rate is not too great. Well, that's all the questions for now. Well, then again, I'll thank everybody for listening and uh, remind those that when you are out enjoying nature, please enjoy it, of course, but uh, adhere to the public health orders that are in effect. But with that, again, thank you very much, and I hope the rest of you have a good evening.